In the last few videos, we've been doing a lot of talking about nucleophilic substitution reactions and elimination reactions. But throughout this video, I actually want to step back a little bit and talk about molecular orbital theory. Even though it might not seem too important, it's actually pretty interesting. For example, when we looked at those SN2 reactions, the highest occupied molecular orbitals of the nucleophile is interacting with the lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals of the electrophile. In order to move on and gain a big holistic picture about what we're talking about, we're going to review just a little bit. Do you remember when we talked about bonding and anti-bonding? What happens when you merge or interact two atomic orbitals? That you create two different types of molecular orbitals, the ones that are focused on constructive forces and the other destructive? Molecular orbital diagram just depicting the difference of energy from the molecular orbitals and the atomic orbitals. The anti-bonding because they have a node being in higher energy than the two atomic orbitals and the bonding orbitals being lower in energy. These diagrams reminding us of our two different types of bonding. Sigma bonding being that head-on collision of two atomic orbitals and their direct merger, where pi bonds are a lateral interaction where there might be a little weaker because the bond electron density is perpendicular to the bond axis. Here's a good representation of the different types of bonding and anti-bonding molecular orbitals that can form. We have the three p orbitals in both our atomic orbital sets. The two p orbitals from each set that are on the same orientation will sigma bond, and that's where you see the sigma bonding and the sigma anti-bonding. Whereas the px and the pz orbitals from both sets will have lateral interactions in this case, forming the two sets of pi bonds. This is a pseudo example of what we might see with the triple bond. Just as we saw with atomic orbitals and electron configuration, electrons elect to fill the lowest orbitals first. It's the same message for molecular orbitals. So with this example here of our molecular orbital diagram of H2, we have two hydrogen atoms interacting with one electron from each atom. The two electrons are going to pair in the bonding set which is the lowest orbital set in this example. But even though it's not depicted here in this example, we can expect with helium, if two helium atoms were interacting with one another, we'll have two electrons paired in the bonding and two electrons paired in the anti-bonding. Even though this is what we will depict its molecular orbital look like, the molecular orbitals wouldn't form because the benefit of lowering the energy from the bonding is going to be negated from the gain of energy from the anti-bonding. Hence why H2 is not a diatomic element in nature. To kind of summarize what we were talking about with helium, if the same number of electrons are in bonding molecular orbitals as in anti-bonding molecular orbitals, then the mo molecule does not form. Here we have the molecular orbital diagram of hydrogen fluoride. So we can see we have one bond as we would expect with HF. The one bond is the sigma bond between the 1s orbital of the hydrogen and the unfilled, but has one electron, 2p orbital of the fluorine molecule. These orbitals are sigma bonding, creating that bond. The orbitals that are not interacting in the molecular orbital bonding, they're called non-bonding. And it's the p orbitals in the fluorine atom that are already filled with electrons. You might be curious on why the atomic orbitals of fluorine are a little bit in lower energy than that of hydrogen, and it's because of the nuclear charge of fluorine pulling in those valence shell electrons closer to the nucleus, which leads to a more stable atom. Next example of molecular orbital diagrams is that of O2. It's a double bond between two oxygen atoms. So, as we can see throughout the diagram, we started filling in the electrons from the lowest energy molecular orbitals first. But the sum or the net molecular orbitals formed is one sigma bond and one pi bond. The two 1s orbitals, molecular orbitals cancel each other out because there's an equal amount of electrons in the bonding and anti-bonding. Now we have to look at how the p orbitals are interacting. There's no electrons in the anti-bonding sigma bond. So we're definitely going to keep that one sigma bond between the two p atomic orbitals. But it gets pretty interesting when we look at the pi bonds. There's two electrons and anti-bonding p 
high bonding. <laughs> I know it gets a little redundant, but there is four electrons in the bonding. So one pi bond is going to be canceled and one is going to be left, leaving us a remaining of one pi bond and one sigma bond. Studying chemistry, you've probably heard the phrase homo and lumo before, and that just refers to the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. In the case for O2, the highest occupied molecular orbital is that of the 2 pi bond, versus the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is that of the 2 sigma antibonding that has no electrons in it. The examples we looked at are of two atoms, hydrogen fluoride, H2, and O2. But we know through our studies that if we add more atoms, we're going to add the possibility of repulsion between the electron groups. And this is where we start talking about valence shell electron pair repulsion models, as we've talked about before. And how the Vesper model might just be more theoretical to lower repulsion of electron groups, atoms really do hybridize to have equal bonding orbitals of the same energetics and to minimize repulsion. In this case of a carbon connected to four different things, we're going to all hybridize four equal orbitals, all four being sp3 hybridized. Whereas if we have double bonding or triple bonding, we know we're going to have unhybridized p orbitals that partake in the double and triple bonding. If we have double bonding, we're going to have one, and if we have triple bonding, we're going to have two. In the case for double bonds, the orbitals are going to be sp2 hybridized. In the case for triple bonds, they're going to be sp hybridized. So let's summarize what we know that we need orbitals to hybridize to be equal energy to interact with other atoms so there isn't like an energy difference. So here we have methane. We know that the carbon atomic orbitals are going to hybridize to make two sp3, four two sp3 orbitals and that each one of these orbitals are going to interact with each of the one hydrogen atoms and methane. So this is a molecular orbital diagram including hybridization. Look how cool it is. Honestly, it was a little hard to depict, but do you see how the sigma bond between the 2sp3 orbital and the 1s orbital from the hydrogen in the molecular diagram is a little bit bigger in the blue side than with the carbon hybridized orbitals? That's because of phase interactions, because they're constructive. But you see in the anti-bonding, they're smaller because of destructive interactions. Next, we can look at the molecular orbital diagram of ammonia. This is kind of similar to that of methane, but remember, ammonia has a lone pair. We can see that lone pair in the one non-bonding 2sp3 orbital. So I find it so cool when you summarize all these topics together and display them through molecular orbital diagrams. Remember, all the graphics that you see me use throughout this video are for free download for you guys. And I hope you guys have a great day and these graphics help you out with your studies. See ya!